Good evening again, and welcome to What Saith the Scripture. I'm Brant Stubblefield. And I'm Christian Franklin. And tonight we're going to be looking at working within the local congregation. Christian, what do you have in mind this evening? Well, you know, this is kind of a, I'll say a part two to a previous broadcast we did titled Obligation to the Local Congregation, but now we're going to focus on working within the local congregation. So what does that mean for each individual member of your local Church of Christ? Too many times, I know you've probably experienced this as well, many people come, they attend, and they, they love services, and, uh, but sometimes, especially in larger congregations, they may not know specifically you know, what they can do themselves yes. to contribute to the work of the local congregation. So, for instance, someone may, like, like I said before, may attend services and, and then leave afterwards, but... They only get really involved in true fellowship and true work with other brethren within the church maybe once a week. And so there's really not much for them to do. And so many people have questions about this, like how can they contribute to the work where they are members at? So that's kind of what I wanted to go Excellent through. topic. Mm -hmm. This was Christian's topic tonight that he wanted to address. I think it's a great one. Before we begin, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this evening, Father, together as members of the Church of Christ far and wide, we hope to endeavor to speak the truth in love tonight, to uplift and to edify. For those who are not members of the Church of Christ, Father, we pray that this lesson tonight will encourage them to consider not only becoming a member of the Church of Christ, but living their life in harmony with the gospel until the very day in which they would die. Father, we want to tell others about Jesus and about salvation. Help us to speak the truth in love and to honor the things within the Scripture. Forgive us of our sins and help us in turn to be willing and ready to forgive others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Christian, what are you thinking tonight? Where, where do you want to start? You know, the inspiration for this lesson actually came from you and uh, your work and many others here at the Deer Creek Congregation. Uh, if you've been following them on Facebook, uh, they've been posting many pictures of their work with the homeless here in the Oklahoma City and Edmond area. And so that inspired me to kind of think of a lesson to teach. And, and we can expound upon more details on this. But basically the idea that the church, the local congregation, many members that may not have roles like I, I think about the presbytery in 1 Timothy 4.14. Not everyone here is either an elder or a, a deacon. And sometimes they may feel like, you know, how can I really contribute to the work? But this, your Facebook post and y'all's work, you're definitely with your family and others here, your work with the homeless, especially during very cold weather here in Oklahoma, if y'all have not caught up with the news, it's been absolutely freezing cold, and it's going to only get worse from here. And so there are many people without a good, you know, good right. warm environment that are suffering. So 
I wanted to take this lesson to say, like, oh, many members here that may not have a, a leadership role, per se, have oh, yes. worked within the local congregation here yes. to help provide for Prince's Most of, all the members yeah. here at Deer Creek have been active in this in some way, right? right? And, and the lesson tonight, we want to talk about how it is that the local church should be prepared and look at good works as a priority in which we need to be engaged in, Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. So I've entitled this little tidbit here, The Power of the Local Church. Christian, how powerful is the local church? And what can one small band of disciples do when they are in full love with God and energized by the teachings of His Word? You know, I think about Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so throughout time and throughout history, we know that the church has prevailed because of many faithful members coming together and working towards, you know, yes. working for things, setting their minds on things above and on the things of the earth. But to maintain good works, right, Titus chapter 3 and verse 8, there's a prioritization, right? There's, there's, a, there's an emphasis on maintaining those good works, and that has helped the Church of Christ specifically thrive. And so, again, you know, we always talk about fellowship. We always talk about assembling. Right. But now it's time to get down to the nitty-gritty and get our hands dirty in a figurative sense and get to work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, real growth is going to occur when we put the knowledge to use and when we engage in kingdom activities, right. when we're doing the work of the Lord. It's, it's kind of like when you go to the gym, you, right, you're building up your physical strength because there's weights and there's resistance. Your body's challenged, it responds. The muscles grow and answers the challenge. The same way spiritually. Our spiritual muscles grow and are exercised when we engage in kingdom work. Amen. Now, we know and we've always taught here on this broadcast because the Bible teaches us there are three main works of the church. They are as follows, evangelism, benevolence, and edification. I don't think it needs to be explained, but very briefly, evangelism is winning souls to Christ, seeking and saving the lost as our Lord himself did, Luke 19 and 10. Edification is that keeping the saved saved, the uplifting, the encouragement, the teaching of the gospel and the fellowship, the engagement of really helping the saved to remain saved. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, Amen. is a good place to read about that. And lastly, but not any less important, is benevolence. Benevolence is going to help us, right, get our foot in the door, so to speak, for evangelism. Uh, benevolence is going to show the heart of God to people. Benevolence is going to help me because it's better to give than to receive, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Amen. There's so many reasons, Christian, but these three works of the church that's why there is power in the local church. If your community is absent of a local congregation of the Church of Christ, it's already at a disadvantage. When the Church of Christ is in an area, in a local congregation, a local community, that town is going to benefit by the work of the church. Even when people in town may not realize it, the town is benefiting from the Church of Christ being there in that town. Absolutely. We'll go back to the Greek word church, ecclesia, however you okay. want to pronounce that. Think about it, it's a, a group of people, it's a body of believers that are consecrated, a peculiar people, Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. And so there is so much power within the church, the body of people. And so speaking about bodies, right, we think about how, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, talking about the local assembly there, the church at Corinth. Now, I want to make this point very clear. We know we read about the manifestation of the Spirit with spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 11. But obviously today we do not have these miraculous gifts bestowed upon us through the Holy Spirit and dwelling. But I want to focus on this specific passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 12. The Bible says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of one body, being many, are, all, are one body, so also is Christ. And then it goes on in verse 13 talking about being baptized into that body. So we, we know by, That's right. we'll, we'll talk about this later down the broadcast, being baptized and being added to the church. But this is so interesting, many members of one body. So we, we make a collective body. We need to be able to be an active, you know, or right. you know, figuratively speaking, a body that is willing to work and grow and, and so improve. let me get this straight. Mm -hmm. You're saying that each congregation is described by Paul. We have one body, right. but there's many members. Amen. So that in every local congregation, there's not going to be any one person that A, does all the work of the Lord, mm -hmm. or that B, is in charge of everything. That it's going to take a community of believers, right? The local congregation, it's going to take us all working together to effectively do 
the Lord's work. Amen. You know, and I was thinking, you skip down to some passages here in verse 17. You know, Paul's asking these questions and he's using different parts of the body as, you know, as, as illustration. Yes. He's saying in verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? The whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? So we see that each part of the body has different designated functions, right? So when we talk about, you know, sometimes people, that's what we're talking about beforehand. Some people may not have direction or maybe know what to do within a congregation because we're like, well, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not an appointed elder. I'm not an appointed deacon. So what can I do? Or I'm not an evangelist of Amen. some sort. So glad you have, brought it up. We have to be careful about that. Yeah. Myth buster number one tonight on this broadcast. If you think that you have to be an elder, a deacon, or an evangelist to do the work of the Lord in your local congregation, you are mistaken. Mm. All members are called to active duty. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 12, Christian beautifully pointed out, there is one body, but many members. Each member has a function or a capacity to serve. Christian, here's a point we ought to make. How powerful is the local congregation? It can be as powerful as we ourselves allow it to be. Amen. Now, the more inactive people in a local congregation, what does that mean? More power. Yeah, well, I said more inactive. Oh, 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 oh sorry. I, I heard I was reading <laughs> something. Okay. But yeah, but it's going to be less. It's going right. to be detrimental. It's going to yeah. de yeah. be detrimental, and it's yeah. going to decrease our ability, right, to go forth and yeah. to save souls for Jesus. So we must, here's, so I think this is a good point we need to make right here, okay? One of the key goals is, is we must, we must do what we can to have more members active in the body of Christ. Amen. Active. That means everybody has a place to serve and something to do. Part of leadership's responsibility, Christian, in every local congregation is to make sure that every member is plugged in, has skinned the game as an invested in kingdom activity. That's right. You know, and think about, we were talking earlier, you know, we have this broadcast here, so not saying that we're only limited to this work, but we do have, we try to work designated roles. Sure. Nemo does a masterful job with right. our filming and doing our, so... These are just one example or just a few examples of how we can take e even just members of the church, the flock, and That's each right. person can have a, a role. And I, the homeless, you know, the homeless people that y'all have helped over the past couple of days have really, I mean, that, that shows the zeal and the passion that even here the members have right. for helping others. And, and that's and not said that. to be seen of men because no. the Bible condemns that. Right. That's said to do two things. Number one, light a fire under all of us to do more for the Lord. Amen. And number three, bring awareness to the fact of what we should be doing as the people of God, right? right? God makes it clear. I mean, we're not just to be baptized into Christ and sit idle in the pews of inactivity and indifference and apathy for many, many, many years until we're called home. In fact, those, according to Matthew 25th chapter, the parable of the talents, right? The man that hid his one talent and those that did not do things in the name of Jesus for others, whether it be give a drink of water or feed or, or visit the prisons. Mm -hmm. If we're not engaged in the Lord's work, then we are going to be sadly mistaken in the end. We're going to have been in Christ, but we're going to have been called out and sifted in the end because we were not really giving it our best as working. Absolutely. You know, and I was studying about liberty. We, we actually had a, a lesson a few Wednesday yes, we nights ago about liberty, being free in Christ. And so we talk about John 8, 32, you know, the truth shall, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I was thinking about other passages too in Galatians 5, uh, verse 1, excuse me, Galatians 5, 1 and Galatians 5, 13. You know, and I love this passage here. For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. We've been called unto freedom. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So I know we're talking within the church, right? Yes. There's, a, there's a strong emphasis in Galatians 6 about the church, serving the church. But again, you know, you may make a point too, in the church of Christ, we make a strong stance against, you know, abortion. We don't want to get too right. dark, but we make a strong, we do. the sanctity of life. Every life counts. Absolutely. So that's a wonderful point you brought up beforehand because the sanctity of life is so important. Why do we only want to focus on, you know, unborn children right. when we can broaden it to all of man? Right. In other That's words, yeah. we're not going to only object to abortion because mm -hmm. of a doctrinal point. Right. We're objecting to it not only because of the doctrinal point within Scripture, but because it reflects against really even the holiness of God. God's holiness says all life is sacred and honorable. Amen. Not just those in the womb, but all the way throughout. That means the person in your neighborhood that's destitute, downtrodden, maybe has mental health issues, maybe homeless for many, many reasons. 
Those people also have a soul and a life, and we are to speak up and to stand up and do what we can to serve one another. Now, Christian, I want to answer this objection. In case on the thread tonight, if somebody else 20 years from now watches this, say, well, preacher, don't you know that some people are a little lazy? And, and, and Paul said, if a man doesn't work, let him don't eat and so right. forth. Okay. I want you to know, because we have been down places like this many times. We've gone to, I won't say exactly where, but Christian, I've gone many places. All right, look at this. First of all, many people have issues that are beyond their control. So to assume that a person is lazy, unless you have evidence, is really to evil surmise, which the Bible condemns. Right. Many people who are abused, maybe sexually, uh, maybe they've been addicted to drugs in the past and their mind is not correct. It could be mental health issues. There is a plethora of reasons. The whole point of this is to say this. Any work takes a requirement, and this is the requirement. We need active members, and point number two, make people aware. Every congregation, there needs to be individuals that make people aware of needs around us in our community. The power of the local church could never be manifest and will never be manifest. I'm going to tell you, Christian, a lot of churches are dead and cold and not growing. Mm. They may teach truth, but they're not growing. Well, one of the reasons they're not growing is because they're not active. You have to be active and involved in the lives of the people. There was a reason that Paul was down at the marketplace, right? There's a reason that Paul was debating and bringing forth doctrinal differences in a public forum. Right. There is a reason that, that Jesus went and preached the gospel to the poor. We have to be active. And unless we get involved with the people that are around us, how are we ever going to convert people to the truth if we're not aware of what's going on? We need all members to be active, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and fulfill their function. We need all members to be aware. Absolutely. You know, and I think about, we talk about the falling away of members of the church because it's just fact that not every single member of the Church of Christ, even if you are a citizen within the kingdom, will not even see heaven. That's right. Now, we want to make sure we don't fall into that category, but we have to be careful as well. I think part of, you know, maintaining those good works we talk about in Titus 3.8, it's going to inspire those maybe who are falling away, maybe to have some purpose or be yes. reignited That's right. to maybe give back something they'd never thought of before. Right. I mean, so that, every local congregation needs to try our dead level best to get all members fully active and participating in the work of the church. Amen. That means come to Bible classes, come to Sunday and evening services if you have those. Come to every service available. Take advantage of the opportunities, right? And then, Christian, as you read, I want to go into Titus 3, okay. 7 through 8. Would sure. you start and read verse 7 first? Sure. Titus chapter 3 and verse 8, or excuse me, 7, starting off in 7. The Bible says that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs, that means by divine inheritance we have been given a place of eternal life, and that justification, sinners made justified under a holiness of God. Well, how are sinners under the holiness of God made justified? That's through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus our Lord. Amen. By the divine grace and unmerited favor of God, there was a plan produced in the determined, for determined, pre-earth, pre-foundation to this world, predetermined for the benefit of humanity. And those of us who have by faith accessed that plan of salvation, we have been justified freely by His grace. Amen. What does Paul say further? This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works, and these things are good and profitable unto men. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So those of us who believe in God, we ought to be careful to maintain good works. Christian, what does the word careful here mean? Careful means, I mean, you're going to prioritize. Okay. It, you know, and that's a word you're going to emphasize the importance, right? To be careful, you know, think about being cautious, right? You're, you're cautious and you prioritize your safety when you, when you see a caution sign or, or a be careful sign. So Paul is imploring us to yes. really emphasize good works and not just say, oh, well, not to compartmentalize good works at some point. He says, as the church, as those who are justified by, you know, re redeemed by him, Romans yes. 3, 24, we have an obligation to maintain these good Amen. deeds and works that we do. So, I mean. Remember from a previous broadcast, the discussion of grace and how grace and giving is tied together? Mm. Notice here the same thing is down in Titus 3, 7 through 8. Freely you have been justified by grace. Right. All right, now what does the, the Scripture teach in verse 8? Therefore we ought to be, it's a worthy and faithful saying, we ought to be careful. Christian points out that requires emphasis and priority. We ought to give emphasis to the maintaining of good works. Good works. Good works 
Christian, I was in it. I mean, this is good. Mm-hmm. The idea of good works here is not just anything that we think, all right? right? Good works really has to do with the ethics, the value system. These are moral good works because they, they basically fulfill the need of society in some way, whether it be a teaching, mm. a spiritual teaching, that is the doctrine of Christ, whether it be helping someone, right, so that they can be fed physically where they can hear spiritually. In other words, God declares what is and what is not a good work. And when our moral souls are subjected to God and we understand what is right and what is wrong based in Scripture, then we are going to be more likely to maintain good works. An immoral man is not going to understand what it means to maintain good works. It's not. You know, I was thinking about the, I think about women here, congregation, you know, women are highly valued here. I mean, in Scripture. Yes. And sometimes I think people want to pinpoint the church and say, well, because women are not in leadership roles, they have no, they have no value in working here, and that's completely false. Hey, man, I'm glad you brought yeah, that and, up. And so I don't oh, mean to don't get on a soapbox here, but yeah. Would anybody be, be interested in an entire broadcast or series of broadcasts on what the sisters ought to be doing in every local congregation? Mm. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 5, that older women should teach the younger women. In most churches of Christ in years gone by, there were lady classes. Ladies came together during some time during the week and met at the building for a class of their own. That's exactly what Titus 2, 5 is talking about. There is a time which older women teach the younger women. Now, the Bible teaches us that sisters have a great work in the church. While they're not going to be officers, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, Mm. because those offices of elders and deacons and evangelists are retained for men. Amen. The Bible teaches that plainly. Mm-hmm. In fact, elders and deacons, the Bible says, husband of one and wife. wife. Yeah. So that removes any possibility of a woman serving in that capacity. But far be it from any of us, therefore, to go too far and to assume or to think that women have no role or little role at all. In fact, any church of Christ that I've ever known, Christian, that's growing and thriving numerically and spiritually, had a solid group of sisters sometimes the very backbone of a congregation that did much of the day-to-day work behind the scenes. Amen. Here's what I want to point out from Titus 2.5 tonight. Okay. You, they want to be a congregation. We want to be a congregation here. Maintaining good works. Sisters, make sure you're organizing where you're at. Ladies Bible classes. Make uh, quilts or affigans for those at the nursing homes. Go ahead and organize uh, flowers and, and, and funeral dinners and all of these different things. We could give a long list list, right? right? Sending out the cards and checking on people and phone calls, prayer trees, whatever it is. Sisters need to make sure they are taking an active interest in the congregation. And sometimes, and in some places, again, churches seem dead, not much life there. I want to ask the question, how are the sisters in that church? Are they active? Mm. Are they meeting? Are they engaged in kingdom activity? We need to explore that on a whole whole class one evening. You know, and even personal observation, even as a young aspiring evangelist, sometimes I see the women trying to put more effort into the work of the congregation, sometimes more than the men. No I mean, doubt. So, not, not to pick on men, but I'm just I saying, mean, we got work Right to here at the day. congregation, every Wednesday at 10 a.m., the ladies meet. Following that class, the ladies always make cards out and send, I'm talking 20, 30, 40, your arm will get tired signing them, to everybody Amen. around. Amen. Some members of the church, some non-members, people in hospitals, people who have been diagnosed with cancer. Those cards are designed to do two things, encourage the saved to keep on going and not give up. It's also to show forth the love and light of Christ to those that are not members so that we can get our foot in the door to hopefully build a relationship and teach the gospel. Amen. We have to do a better job of being active in kingdom business. Absolutely. You know, and, I, and furthering on from that point, you know, I think about, I was actually talking to our, our deacon of groundskeeping last night. Yes. And he was up here working his tail off. Does a great job. You know, does a great job. He was salting the eyes to yes. make sure it melts. I mean, he's, he's taking care of this building. It's been, it's been a great job. Yes. And that tells me something that each person can have a, you know, and it's maybe sometimes he gets help from maybe some other men here or whatever, but that tells me that there is a, there, there's such an emphasis and there's such a, I have a high reverence for true fellowship and edifying one another, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, by doing these works and contributing to our local congregation. It's so yes. important. Look, I mean, it's, I mean, we can't reiterate that point enough. 
Five yeah. points that every church of Christ locally, if it wants to be powerful, ought to think about. Mm. Have active members. 1 Corinthians 12, one body, many members. Everybody having a different function. Every person fulfilling their function. Amen. Number two, awareness. Leadership is to bring awareness to needs around the community. Let's get engaged. Let's be led. Number three, let's emphasize and prioritize this. That's why the Bible says be careful. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. Be careful, pay attention to, and emphasize the need to maintain good works. Christian, what about this one? Prepare. Mm. We need to be prepared. That means we don't wait until something happens. No. The church of Christ and the local community is ready to go. Amen. What are some of the things we could do to prepare? Possibly. You know, I talk about, you know, well, spiritually, obviously, we need to strengthen our members here through sound doctrinal teaching, but also get us prepared to go out into the world, you know, to make sure that we are shining our light to all those and glorify our Father which is in heaven, right. Matthew 5, 16. And many times I've heard this too, Matthew 5, 16, I'm not saying we can't be good examples by just not cussing or not using, you know, just doing things in the world, but also being a light is also doing, unto, you know, doing good unto men. I think about Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, Jesus always went about doing, doing good. good. So why, can, you know, if we're going to be like Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, we should be doing the same. Yeah, the, that, the love and light for. of Jesus must mm. go forth for people to be, to be ready to listen, right? right? It's not just telling people, it's also showing forth mm. the good works of God. When we are doing good works, we are basically showing the world a small token of what it is like to A, be a Christian, and B, to serve under the king. So it, it's imperative that we do that. Christian, I thought about this. In the idea of preparedness, even with the contribution, the whole reason we lay by and store mm, okay. is so that we don't have to make any gatherings when Paul would come, right? right? In other words, I want to say this tonight. There's nothing wrong occasionally, right, with, with individuals uh, asking for additional help. But here's the point. If local congregations were giving properly, the money is already laid up in the bank account to immediately respond to any need. That's why we have a treasury. It's stored up, ready to go. That's one way of being prepared. Second way is remembering, Christian, that everybody in the congregation knows that when something happens, the church is going to immediately meet, we're going to organize, and we're going to do something, and they have to be ready. Absolutely. Uh, Nemo? Yes, I want to read a comment that was posted by uh, Caleb. It's not about the role I may be skilled at and want to do, but what God has defined for us to do. And I think about that you know, here in this congregation that there was a time where I wasn't doing a lot of video stuff. We weren't doing a lot of the technology because we wasn't prepared at the time. So I was asked to do things that put me out of my comfort zone. And I will say at first I said no. And then when I thought about it, why was I saying no? And then that's when I made the decision, okay? If God wants me to do this, then I need to be doing this because that's what it says in Scripture. This is what I need to be doing. So why haven't I done that? Just because I didn't feel like I was good enough to do that. So you just had to realize God's not expecting perfection. He wants you to go do things. Yes. He wants you to follow what he says. You don't have to be perfect, the perfect singer. You won't have the perfect lesson. You won't have the perfect um, material just to say the right word. Sometimes you'll make mistakes. But if you are following what the Bible says, you're reading Scripture, you're learning, you're improving, that's where the good works can flourish because you're actually putting in the work and not just saying no because, oh, I don't think I can do it well. Amen. Bobby Bryant also brings a good point on the Facebook thread this evening. Some brethren want to cast it off to other people. Mm. Well, so-and-so is going to do it. Maybe the Salvation mm. Army or this one or that one. Someone last on the thread said, what about the Catholic Charities? Folks, the church of the New Testament needs to be doing kingdom business. Amen. So when we put forth the love of God and the light of the gospel, people will be drawn to that. If we only think and depend upon others to do that work, how can we expect ever to be approved of God or reach the lost? We're not going to reach souls that we don't interact with. You have to interact with them to reach them. And so I think Bobby Bryant brings up a good point. And Bobby, keep on the firing line and suggest wherever you attend and, and, and wherever that is, suggest unto them it's time for the Church of Christ to be the leader in our communities in taking the full gospel in areas of benevolence and edifying the local church. We've got to get back to kingdom work if we're going to expand the local church in our generation. Nemo. And Forrest Boxen says, if no one knows that you are a Christian, they will just think you are only a good person. And I would even add on to that. 
if they don't even know that we're members of the Church of Christ, then they may just think we're just in uh, the, one of these organizations or even just a good person. I have heard so many people tell me that, oh, I don't need God or I don't need religion to be a good person. Meanwhile, they are benefiting from virtually every institution yes. that was influenced by Christianity and by the religious atmosphere of this world. So it's not good enough just to say, oh, I'm a good person. We need to let people know, hey, we are doing this as members of the Church yes. of Christ. Because yeah. that one will thing, interest them. I'm glad you brought that up. The one thing we do when we take the bags out or the sleeping bags or, or the bags of food, whatever it is, all the people are trained to tell, to tell everyone, this is from your friends who care about you in the churches of Christ. Amen. Romans 16, 16. Secondly, right, we always emphasize to people, and even publicly when we're passing the things out, you, you can't have an hour formal sermon in a, in, a, in a suit and tie, but you can go ahead and with a loud megaphone voice, especially like we have, right, let people know the gospel plan of salvation and go ahead immediately and not only think about the physical food that you're receiving that's only going to last you for a day, but think about that food, that heavenly manna that only comes from above every word of God that proceeds the mouth of Jesus and you need to obey the gospel and remove, right, remove yourself from the world and enter into the church through biblical baptism. We must teach people, and that's a great point. It's not enough to give physically. We must back that up with spiritual teaching. Great point. Yeah, and the spiritual teaching, you know, the sound doctrine, Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, I mean... I don't see or have any, any evidence of these other charities. I, I know they're trying to do good works. I don't discount them for that at all. But when they're not even teaching the Bible, I mean, that's going to that's, that's right. that's lead people Amen. astray. They're, they're going to get this idea because, and I also think about this too, what helped me really get into the church and get into Bible study was the warmth and the love of the church. Amen. It, really, it really helped me get into Bible study and then actually learn the truth. Amen. So, I mean, it Changed my life. I know Brother that. Wilson also makes a good comment. Lots of great comments tonight. Mm. He's, he's correct. We're never going to be able to match possibly dollar for dollar what some big uh, denomination does. But I will say that, this, that's no excuse for us to do nothing. We do what we can do. And that's the key. I believe strongly in the Bible teaches the providence of God. Amen. If we assemble as 15 or 20 people and with our resources do what we can do and take the things that we have and share them with others and teach the gospel alongside that, there is going to be benefit, positive, come from that. God's people need to be on the front lines in our community and get the name of the Church of Christ out there and the teaching of the gospel and how to become a Christian. That's crucial. If we don't, if we don't, we will be less in number 10 years from now than we are today. Yeah, and absolutely, you know, uh, especially within smaller congregations, many people have more designated roles. You know, not I shouldn't say scriptural leadership roles, yes. but they do have, uh, they do partake in good works. And so sometimes with these larger congregations, you know, no, no, not to not to pinpoint or prick at them, but so many people are lost. And so we really have to emphasize these points over right. and over again. Right. We have to make people feel like they do have a purpose within Amen. the church. God has a purpose for them to work in their local congregation. So Another reason I like good works, Christian, mm -hmm. Titus 3.8, and every member being active is because most of us train very well in the conservative church of Christ. We're trained mm -hmm. how to teach Bible studies, right? How to teach your friends and your neighbors about the saving grace of Christ and the plan of salvation, the oneness of the church, how to worship, all those things. But here's our problem. We're not reaching enough people in our communities. So one of the things that being engaged in good works does, it allows us, it doesn't have to be the homeless, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Right. Uh, you used to go quite a bit to the VA center and pray with people, right, mm -hmm. that are, are near the end of life. Whatever it is, getting out in that community, it's going to help facilitate, yes. it's going to help facilitate an environment that's more conducive and likelihood to present itself in Bible studies. In fact, this evening, I won't call out who, but because of what happened downtown today, somebody contacted one of our sisters here, Sister Allison. Somebody contacted her with basically a spiritual need, and it may be the case that we get to study with somebody tomorrow. Mm. Uh, they gave her my cell number. We don't know yet. Be praying right. for that. So, so it does help to get out and to be active. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. Read that whole thing one more time, Christian. Sure. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 8. The Bible says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. 
these things are good and profitable unto men. Yes, amen. 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 So, they're good and profitable. Show me a person that is out doing the work of the Lord, he or she will be blessed by God. Amen. Because they're going to have challenges that are presented to them. It's like when I first started trying to teach people. I did really not know enough Bible to answer most objections, right? Mm -hmm. I knew the plan of salvation. But when someone would ask me a question, you know, well, you're not a Calvinist? I had to go home and ask Brother Wiggins. I said, well, Brother Wiggins, what's a Calvinist? Right. I didn't even know. But what that did, that made me sharpen my ax and I learned with every question I couldn't answer, guess what happened? I learned the answer to that question. Mm. So the only way that I'm even to do what I do today in a very small way is because other men took the time to teach me and be patient with me and answer the questions that I had. The same is true to you and the same is true to me. And whatever it is that we're doing in the body of Christ, we must be active. We have to find something to do to be active and to challenge ourselves and to grow. And if you are a one talent man, Brother Wilson's correct. There's no shame in being a one-talent man. The shame and the sin that makes you a wicked servant is if you bury that one talent mm. out of timidity, not being willing to do something with it. Take that one talent, use it to the glory of God prayerfully under His providence. Not only will He bless you, you'll end up having much more ability in the end when you use it properly. You know, I'm glad you brought up that word timidity and shyness. You know, there's so many individuals I could be doing you know, or, or could be teaching lessons, but sometimes they're just so shy. Right. And I'm not trying to pick on, you know, people that are introverted. I'm not trying to pick on personality traits, but here's what but I'm trying to say. It. But sometimes they try to utilize that as an excuse right. to not be doing more than what they could be doing. Yeah, I mean, we could so all I just, use excuses. I have to call it out sometimes, you know. Believe it or not, my first sermon was not quite five minutes. Mm. You think I talk fast now? I talk so fast then I went from Genesis to Revelation. I don't know how much of it I got right in a little less than five minutes. Mm. It takes time to develop in anything right. that we do. And that's right. Part of a leadership in every congregation, coaching people to become active and aware and emphasize and be prepared and organized, it takes a patience and endurance to allow people to grow in the cycle. Because in a lot of places, right, we, we've suffered in these areas. Right. Lastly, we must be organized. The Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. Mm. First Corinthians chapter 14, 14 and verse 40. 40. Now that in reference to the assembly, but also by principle, is a divine application to all of us today. Amen. Whatever we do in the name of Jesus, not only must be by his authority, Colossians 3 and 17, it needs to be decent and in order. And so then we pass out things to the homeless, whether we're knocking doors, which we're going to do as soon as this weather goes up, I think, over here across the street from the building. We knock doors on a new neighborhood. We take baskets to the needy. If we visit the nursing homes, if we go down to the vet, veterans uh, department and, and see people, whatever we're doing, it needs to be in an organized fashion so that the work of the Lord is not an embarrassment and a shame. Mm. And I'm not talking about individuals. We all individually do works. Right. But when the church decides to do something collectively as an organized effort, it ought to be done well. It ought to be done honorable. And even the way in which we approach people, we ought to be ready to go and not, uh, not half-heartedly. You know, and what better way to spend your time than doing the work of the Lord? I mean, yes. what better way to spend your time? Yes. I just don't see. Remember, when Jesus comes, listen to this, Christian. We'll close with this. Okay. In Revelation, in Revelation chapter 20, I want you to think about this. If I can find it here. Well, I thought I had it here. Right here. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 12. Mm. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's important, Christian. Mm. It's important because Jesus is going to analyze what we have done. Again, Revelation chapter 22, verse number 12, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Mm. We want to be serving God and living every day in anticipation of the second coming of Christ. Amen. Speaking of the second coming of Christ, Christian, do you think everybody is ready to meet Jesus when he comes? I don't know. I mean, based on 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we read about those who do not know God and who have not obeyed the gospel Amen. of Christ. 
So, you, so you're saying, according okay. to Paul in mm. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, yeah. that anybody who has not obeyed the gospel is not ready to meet Jesus. And I, in fact, yeah. they're going to be punished. They're going to be punished. Yeah. Okay, so is there anywhere in the Bible that tells us what it is and what it means to obey the gospel? To obey the gospel, right, we need to believe in those facts. We read about 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the beautiful facts, the death, the burial, the resurrection. But is it just enough to believe those facts? It's no. not. Yeah, we have to believe the gospel, that's right. true, but, but, but how would we obey the gospel? Obey the gospel. I think in Mark 16, 16, correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. But Mark 16, 16, Jesus himself says this, right? Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the gospel is this, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and, the conjunction and, is baptized shall be saved. So in that passage, we have the summary of salvation. Mm -hmm. We have the command, the idea of being bad, excuse me, believing in the gospel Amen. and also being baptized into Christ. So the belief of the gospel and being baptized as obedience to the gospel, both are necessary for the saving power of the gospel to come to the individual of which is an obedience to the words of Jesus. That's right. Obey the gospel tonight, sinner. Obey the gospel, friend. Obey the gospel. Because without obedience to the gospel, nobody can be saved. No. I had to obey the gospel because I was in sin. Amen. He had to obey the gospel because he was in sin. Amen. Sin is a separativeness. It is a separation. And it has eternal damning consequences. Romans 6 and 23, a penalty that you and I cannot afford to bear. No. But praise be to God, Jesus died on the cross so that you and I, Hebrews 10 and 9, might have life eternal, John 3 and 16. And if you, by His grace, Ephesians 2, 8, if you, by His grace, if you will access that grace by faith tonight in believing in Jesus, the Son of God, John 8 and 24, repenting of your sin, Luke 13 and 3, Amen. confessing His name before men, Acts 8 and 37, and surrendering in baptism fully, Colossians 2 and 12, you therefore have obeyed the gospel. Amen. And if you keep that gospel in memory that Paul preached by living every day faithful in the New Testament church, that is the church of Christ, you'll be rewarded someday when this life is over. Christian, as we wrap up this broadcast tonight, is there anything that you'd like to tell our viewers? You know, talking about good works, maintaining good works, that's part of being faithful to God. That's part of us being righteous unto God, right? We talk about prayers being heard by, you know, by God, by righteous people. Well, part of being righteous, part of observing the divine commands that he has given us, Matthew 28, 20, is maintaining good works. So we want to ask you tonight, yes. as a member, if you are a member of a local congregation of the Church of Christ, are you doing the work? Are you contributing to the work of your, of your congregation? That's and if, question, not, yeah. if not, let's don't sit down in a bed of ashes and cry over spilled milk. No. Let's repent and confess. Let's move on and let's make the rest of this year the best year ever. Let's Amen. work to the glory of God and build up the church of Christ and our local communities. Amen. And until next time, there is a question that every single one of us ought to be asking when it comes to any religious question. Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. What, what saith, saith the, the Scripture? scripture? Oh, no.